Quick announcement to those in the room and those online. We are still waiting for two members uh, that we need for the quorum. So uh, bear with us. We're now waiting for one member.
And can we turn our microphones on, please? All right, good evening. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, we now have a quorum, so we will call this meeting, a uh, regular meeting of the Providence City Plan Commission to order at 4.55 p.m. Uh, let's start off by taking a roll call. So, Miguel Casado, present. Chris Potter, present. Nicole Verdi, present. And I am uh, Michael Gazdaco. I'm acting as the chair. We also have uh, two members of staff. Bob Azar. Shayan Mandrick, our EPD staff. Lisa Dan and Legal oh, Counsel. Three, excuse me, three, three members. Um, all right, you all had your, uh, you should have gotten minutes from three previous meetings. Um, the September 20th, the October 11th, and the October 18th uh, CPC meetings. Um, can we take them all as, at once unless someone has any comments or corrections? Well, if if um if we if we're going to abstain from one of those, all right, let's let's okay. start well no. one or one or the other. So the September twentieth um, meeting minutes. Um, Make a motion to approve. Thank you. We need a second. Second. All right, we have a second. All in favor of approving the minutes as drafted, say aye. 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 And abstain. All right. Uh, the October uh, any. Um, that's all, that's everyone. Uh, any, the October 11th meeting minutes, you all received them. Motion to approve. Great, second? Second. All right, we have a motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Abstain. Abstain, I think I was there for that. You weren't there for that one? I believe that was the one. Okay, so Christian will abstain on that one. And then the October 18th CPC meeting. Motion to approve. Okay. Second. We got a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 And I will abstain from that one because that's the one I wasn't at. Um, so we will move right into director's report. Um, nothing really to report this month. All right. That was uh, concise. <laughs> <laughs> we will go on. Maybe to next month. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go on to our first land development project. Uh, this is a major land development project. It's case number 22-057MA. It's a 159 Wayland Avenue, also known as 230 Waterman Street. Um, we have the applicant here and uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and hear from them. Oh yeah, actually, Shoyana, you're gonna introduce it, right? Yeah, sure. And thanks, Commissioner, just to provide some background before the applicants get to presenting. This is a request for a combined master and preliminary plan approval for a project that consists of commercial on the ground floor, as well as residences on the upper stories. And the applicant is looking to construct that project. And they are also looking for a waiver from submission of state approvals at the preliminary plan stage. And it should be noted that when they will be presenting, they will be talking to you about the building, its conformance with zoning, and the, and speak about the submissions that they need to make at both stages. So the applicants are here, they can take it from there. Thank you. And we'll make you a panelist. So um, while you're doing that, I will start. Uh, my name is Andrew Tights, T is in Thomas, E-I-T-Z. I'm an attorney with offices at 2 William Street in Providence, representing the applicants and owners here today for this project. Um, and we'll try to be brief. Um, this is, however, a new project. You may recall we were here before we did receive master plan approval for project. Um, 232 Waterman Street, it was a larger, more intense project. Um, the master plan approval was appealed um, and um, that was withdrawn by us. It has no legal standing anymore. And we are here with a brand new project. In fact, we even have a brand new name for it. It's, 195, it's 159 Wayland Avenue. We've changed the address. Um, so that makes an easier shorthand way to talk about it. We're here about 159 Wayland. Um, but it is a site that I think all of you know, the site of the uh, funeral home, 
um, and you'll be hearing more about that in a minute. <clears throat> um, key thing here I want to make sure you realize is that we comply with all zoning elements. We're not asking any variances, special use permits, waivers, anything at all as far as the substance. Um, key elements of um, issues that were concerns before, height, loading, and parking, um, we are compliant with the height. We are under 50 feet in height, and you'll hear the details, but we are not asking for any relief whatsoever on the height. Um, as far as the loading, we are below the thresholds for the required loading, no matter how you interpret it. So no loading space is required. So that we are fully compliant with. Um, and the parking, we actually have twice the parking that we need. Um, so there shouldn't be any question about um, parking impacts on the neighborhood um, with people parking in the neighborhood. We're gonna be providing twice the parking that's legally required. Um, as to the um, the waivers that were mentioned, we're not asking for any waivers of any substance. They're only procedural. They're asking for um, normally before preliminary, we would have um, other state approvals, um, which we are asking to provide for final, um, those being Narragansett Bay Commission, Rydum, and Providence Water Supply. They're all in process. This is an urban site served by all the utilities. There isn't any anticipation of any issue. Um, but that's, they're still in process. So we would ask that those be waived to be provided at final. If you have any questions about them, we do have our engineer, he'll be talking uh, in a moment and uh, address those issues, um, the particular utilities and so forth. Um, and then finally, um, we would ask procedurally, as noted by Choyan, that you combine master plan and preliminary. Again, we've got an urban site, we've got a very low intensity use here. Everybody seems to be familiar with it. There's no, there's no interesting twists or turns to it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and so we are asking to combine those stages and also ask you at the end, if you do so approve it, to authorize staff approval for final approval. So with that, I'm going to start with our first witness, um, Eric Zuena, and I would just um, ask, um, you just tell him about your credentials. You're an architect, you're licensed in 12 states, correct? Hi, Eric Swena, Managing Principal of CDS, Architecture and Interiors, offices in Providence, Rhode Island, and Washington, D.C., uh, combined total of about 35 staff. Um, um, I've been a principal at my firm for seven plus years, uh, served on the AIA as president uh, in 2018, uh, on the Board of Advisors for the Broad Dreams University, um, actively uh, participate in our community as not only an architect uh, and business owner, but as a citizen of the city of Providence and uh, excited to be in front of you this evening. I would ask that you be accepted as an expert in architecture. Uh, so when we act as the planning board, we don't normally uh, accept uh, expert witnesses. Um, we'll notice your credentials, but Thank you. there's no need. I just have to go through the, the steps. Go ahead. Uh, do you want to call him? Yeah. I'm going to start with, um, yeah, actually, let's start with Paul Gresson. Uh, your name and address? Uh, Paul Gressinger, G R I E S I N G E R. Uh, good evening. Thank you uh, for having us back. Um, we uh, submitted a project, as Andy mentioned, um, and was approved on a project in um, uh, November 2021. Uh, the project was um, a five-story, uh, 24 apartment um, project with uh, two retail spaces. And um, right after we were approved, we were appealed um, on the project. And my partner, um, who and I, who have been involved in Wayland Square, I've been involved for 30 years, he's been involved for 60 years, but with the involvement that we've had in the square, we decided to reset and relook at the project and decided to um, take some of the information that was raised as part of the approval process on the last project and consider reconsider, basically, um, could we 
redevelop this project um, with a smaller mass and a smaller density and more parking, which were pretty much the items that were uh, raised in the, um, uh, the in terms of some of the comments and, and, and definitely from the people that appealed the project. So the team at ZDS and we sat down and spent about six months going through the project and decided what you're going to see today is a condominium project um, that is uh, obviously a significant reduction. Um, you're going to see 12 units. You're going to see one retail space. Um, and uh, you'll see uh, 24 parking spaces. We feel that um, it's a great project. Um, we, we hope you like it. And, uh, you know, we look, we look for your comments and, and uh, look forward to hopefully getting this project going. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And now for Eric to start taking you through the uh, presentation. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> uh, again, uh, echoing a few points. Very happy to be here. Uh, very exciting project for a very, very important piece of land in Wayland Square. Uh, and I'll kick off just by quickly running through the location uh, on the corner of Waterman and Wayland Avenue. And to the right are a few uh, of our neighbors, uh, familiar buildings to I'm sure all of us in the room. Uh, this is uh, some photographs of the existing site, uh, the existing structure on the site. Now, uh, you know, up till about two, approximately two years ago, this was a very active and successful funeral home. Um, and uh, the uh, McBride's uh, pub is to our uh, left or to the north of our property. And uh, part of the exercise here is to remove or raise the funeral home and hold on to McBride's pub. Uh, and separating the, the parcel to allow for the structure to be built. This diagram uh, was helpful for us in the studio just to talk about the livability of the site, to talk about alternate means of transportation and uh, uh, moving through uh, town. Uh, the dashed line shows a two minute walking radius. The uh, bus stops are all uh, labeled here on this diagram. And also uh, we showed two different colors. Um, the purple, purplish blue color is showing a, you know, a, a commercial corridor uh, and then showing this beige uh, buffer. We can call it a buffer. It's a uh, parking for what we consider perpetuity that gives us a little separation from the properties to the east, which are uh, more residential, uh, one to three unit residential in scale. Um, I'll also point out, it's not labeled here, but it, it'll come up later in the presentation. We do have a designated uh, delivery and package uh, 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 locate loading zone here on South Angel Street. This is just our uh, boundary survey. And this is just an introduction to the overall aesthetic of the building. Uh, we're going to talk about the materiality and the planning in more detail, but this is a view looking from uh, the Wayland uh, Waterman corner, uh, looking northeast uh, towards the property. What you'll notice, I think it's important to point out here, is the main arrival experience on Wayland Avenue and uh, the um, shielded uh, interior parking zone, which we're doing with some clear story windows at the upper areas of that floor. And, you know, in, in articulating the architecture here with some landscape planting beds, which we'll spend more time talking about when we're um, uh, unpacking the landscape plan. What also is important to mention is our, um, our ingress point for vehicular traffic. It's just about in the same exact location as it is now. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the site, this is the access point uh, into the rear of the funeral home. I think what we are doing, what's a little cleaner in this presentation is the Right now, the, the uh, elevation of the parking lot is raised. So coming in and out of that parking lot might be a little bit cumbersome for, us, for some. Uh, this is all at grade. So we're bringing down the elevation of the site and we're allowing all our, our, our ingress points for pedestrians to be at the same elevation as the sidewalk. And we're doing that again to make for a grand arrival experience and also to use the, best, use the site for its best intended use. This is the first floor uh, showing uh, how uh, we're sort of set up here programmatically. And again, Wayland Avenue here, 
uh, Waterman along the bottom. And you know, there's plenty of uh, technical data that I'd like to review quickly, uh, just to keep us all on the same page as we march through the presentation. Uh, first and foremost, we'll talk about the, just from a Part T diagram standpoint, we have an arrival lobby space here. We have a small tenant space of just over 1,100 square feet. And then the remainder of the building in the rear is uh, for 24 parking spaces. This is a condominium project, so we do think it's important that we surpass the uh, regulation or the, the zoning requirement for parking and we allow two spaces per unit uh, from a marketability standpoint. We also have trash room. Uh, you'll see in the upper floors, we have a trash chute that brings trash to this first floor. And we'll talk uh, later about how it exits the building. And we have a secondary elevator in this corner just for mere convenience. Um, going through some of the facts that I think are important relative to the points that uh, Mr. Tights made at the beginning of the presentation. Um, the total uh, GSF or GFA uh, for the project is uh, 36,601 square feet. And even though we determine or interpret uh, things a little bit differently. We're including the exterior cladding in that calculation. We're including the shared lobby space in that calculation and also storage utility rooms in that calculation. Uh, there is an additional uh, item that we wanted to uh, uh, point out is that, you know, we have canopies on the exterior of the building, one over the uh, entry ex uh, experience here. And then we have a couple of secondary uh, awnings over these uh, two window systems that, for the tenant. And that totals uh, 170 additional square feet. So again, even when you add the 170 additional square feet, which we're not suggesting that we should, uh, we're, we're well below that 40,000 square foot uh, GFA calculation. For, and that, that's relative to loading space. And that's, again, something Mr. Teich pointed out early on in the presentation. Uh, from a, uh, when you move upstairs, um, and we can come back to some of that text in a second, uh, we're talking about three uh, floors. They all pretty much stack. There are a couple nuances just to allow for the building to undulate a little bit and create some dynamics in our facade, but it's a total of 12 units, per, four per floor. And, you know, we have the circulation around this inside edge, which is where, uh, you know, we're adjacent to the McBride's pub or the inside property line. Uh, for vehicles, as mentioned, uh, one per unit, so 12 spaces required. Uh, bicycle spaces, one-fifth uh, one per unit, uh, which equals about 2.4 spaces. Uh, we, have, uh, tw we have 24 parking spaces and we have uh, four uh, bicycle spaces provided. Okay. You'll notice on the third and fourth floors, again, just to create some variety of unit type, we have some balconies that are shown along the property line. It's a little lag here, sorry. And then this is the rooftop. So um, we're showing uh, some accessory structures up on the roof. We have four patios that are set back from the street. Uh, they stack on top of the units below. Uh, each stair has two access to two of those patios and the rest of the space is reserved for mechanical units. For, uh, from a finished standpoint, um, we have basically a combination of masonry precast, uh, some cementitious panel and brick uh, veneer or full wide brick. I think we're probably leaning to a full wide product, but a great combination of a, you know, what we consider a pretty, um, well-appointed exterior envelope uh, uh, just to make this, um, these, these condominiums really, really successful. Uh, showing an example of the front awning, an example of the uh, canvas awnings that are wrapping the corner for that, that retail tenant, uh, showing concepts for rooftop trellis uh, and composite moldings, uh, lap siding, et cetera. Balcony glass railing example. Uh, this, this is looking uh, southeast uh, towards the arrival experience and also, um, you know, we, we silhouetted in uh, McBride's pub here just to show uh, context and to show the relationship to our neighbor, uh, but we did feel important to show how we're um, appointing this, this inside edge uh, and making sure that we're, uh, you know, using the right materials for the condition and also greening things up just to create some, uh, a great experience for all residents.
this is showing uh, a view towards the uh, west uh, almost, uh, from Merchant's Lot, approximately but standing in the street from Merchant's Lot back towards the building. Again, just showing how we're articulating this enclosed parking area along this grade and how we're uh, using landscape to help us articulate that space. Uh, also, I think it's we were we're excited to bring the fenestration and the articulation of of material to the inside elevation uh, because we understand just how important this elevation is, um, like our A Street elevations. Like what? A streets or like Waterman and Wayland elevations. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to spend an extra minute on this slide just to make sure that we're all speaking the same language because sometimes when we're talking about building height, things get a little confusing. So, you know, we're confident, confidently estimating our average grade at 101 feet, three inches above sea level. And what you see on the left hand side are uh, important dimensions. The, the ones in black are is the important one. And that is our overall building height. Um, that's, you know, meeting all zoning uh, ordinances uh, and and, you know, we pay special attention to making sure that we're measuring to top of membrane. That height is 49 feet, 10 inches. We're in a grade gray scale. We're showing additional heights just for a reference point that do not uh, uh, that are not included uh, into overall uh, building height. But we have them there just as reference points uh, to answer any questions or concerns of um, of the board with regards to building height. And as you move through all the elevations, they're all set up the same way, uh, showing that solid uh, full opacity dimension showing to uh, top of membrane, and then the grayscale dimension showing additional uh, accessory uh, rooftop structures that are happening on site that do not contribute to overall building height. Again, this is that northern elevation uh, with McBride's dashed in here just to show its relationship. Photometric plan, um, you know, I know that's this is probably hard to read, but you know, basically what it shows is it shows lighting and how that affects the uh, sidewalk and, and pedestrian experience around these three edges. Also, even in the alley, we're making sure that this is still a, a usable and, um, and uh, safe uh, experience and then showing 0, 0.0 along the back edge, just showing how it, how we hit our property line with zero light. Some examples of our exterior lighting uh, concepts at this time, wall sconces. And so from here, um, I'd like to uh, bring um, uh, our civil engineer uh, and he'll walk you through um, uh, landscape, civil, utilities, and some additional points that we think are important for this presentation. And I'll circle back to answer any questions. Hey, yes, I'm Stephen Cabral with Crossman Engineering at 151 Central Road, Board Road. Thank you. And can you tell the commission just a little bit about your background and experience briefly? Uh, uh, briefly. <laughs> I, so they don't want to formally vote on an expert, but just for the record. Uh, yes, I've been an engineer for the past 40 years. I've been with Cross Engineering for 38, and I've been the main principal president since 1999, so for 23 years. We have a staff of 26 staff members. We also have an office in Massachusetts. And I'm licensed in Rhode Island, Mass, Connecticut, New Hampshire. And we had projects throughout the state for many decades. One recent example happens to be the building right across the street on the other side of, <clears throat> excuse me, the other side of Waterman. Um, and you've been accepted before as an expert by zoning board and other boards and commissions throughout the state of Rhode Island. Yes. yes. As, a, as a civil expert, civil engineering and traffic engineering as well. Yes. Take us through the civil engineering and traffic aspects. Yeah, okay. Because the parking area is actually inside the building on the first floor, there's a bit of an overlap between what I would normally present and what the architect presented. But just to make sure I cover all the bases, I'm just going to overlap. Uh, the first item we looked at was the requirements for parking. 
And based upon the city zoning code for 12 residential units, we're required to have, have 12 spaces. And as it's been stated a couple of times, we are actually doubling what's required. We're providing 24 spaces on the first floor of the, the uh, excuse me, the first floor of the building. The parking layout has been designed to fully conform to the city requirements in the sense that the aisles were 22 feet wide, the normal spaces are eight and a half feet wide by 18 feet long. And we are providing a couple of compact spaces, which are seven and a half feet by uh, 17, uh, 15 feet long. And those are the ones by the, the staircase, as you'll see. When it comes to loading, again, I'll be quick because it hasn't been stated. We did take a close look at the gross floor area and we do concur that for, um, for a condominium project that's less than 40,000 square feet. At the worst case, we're in the neighborhood of 36,000 square feet plus or minus. So we are exempt from requiring any loading spaces associated with the residential. And for that one commercial space, the size is approximately 1,300 square feet, which is below the, the requirement for, for loading. Now, when it comes to loading, we also looked at more than just the city zoning requirements. We also looked at it from a practical perspective. And that is, if you have a building with 12 units in a one small commercial, commercial facility, is there really a demand for a dedicated loading space? And it's our opinion as traffic engineers that it's, it's not. It's really not required from a practical perspective to have its own dedicated loading area. We also confirmed that there, there are existing loading spaces on the city streets within the neighborhood. So when there is a demand for a delivery, there are spaces on existing streets that can be utilized legally. We've also been in contact with the city curb administrator and she's confirmed or she's made us aware that she believes it's not necessary to provide an allocated loading space for this project. She did indicate that if someday in the future, the need does arise and exist, the city would be more than willing to work with us to find a new dedicated space. But again, in regards to the zoning ordinance, a practical perspective, and the fact that there are existing spaces nearby, there, there really is no need to provide a separate dedicated uh, loading area. One item I'd like to point out is the access location into the parking lot it is at a very optimal location in the sense that as you exit the site or enter, there's a clear line of sight. One thing I'll point out is that as you're leaving the parking garage, Waterman Street is one way to the east. So you actually have two lanes flowing to the east and you, there's a parking lane on the opposite side of the street. So when you exit, you have a clear line of sight looking back towards Wayland and you don't have the conflicting traffic coming in the other direction. So it's really a perfect location for the entrance driveway. One item I will point out is that as it was stated, our driveway entrance is at approximately the same location as the existing funeral home location. The big difference is that if you were to leave the property today, there's a significant slope as you exit the parking lot down towards Waterman. So it is a little awkward and it does impact the line of sight. With the proposed design, the grades are essentially going to be level. So you don't have that, the conflicting topography to deal with. You'll have a, a flat roadway and the line of sight is clear. Okay, for the next slide, I'd like to get up, briefly discuss drainage. Now, typically when we design drainage for a development, our primary focus is making sure that we don't increase the runoff, the peak flows of the volumes exiting a site. For this site, we're able to go a step further. And the reason is, based upon the soil borings that we collected, we found that the underlying soils, once you get below the fill of the, the, the parking lot, is a good sandy soil, little gravel, very little silt. So we have a good sandy soil with the high infiltration capacity. The soil borings went down approximately 40 feet and they found that the, the water level, the groundwater level was well below 30 feet below grade. So we have optimal conditions to create an infiltration system to collect and mitigate the runoff. 
what we were able to do working with the architect is actually designed an underground infiltration system made of precast four by four chambers right inside the building. As you can see, there are three, you know, three rows. So that represents a series of precast concrete infiltration chambers below the building. And because the soils were so, so good in the sense, when I say good, they're highly permeable, we're able to collect all of the runoff from the rooftop, connect it into this infiltration system, and we're able to design it in a manner such that during the theoretical 100-year storm event, which is a little over eight inches of rainfall, the system will fully detain that and allow it to infiltrate. So as long as the system is maintained properly, up to the 100-year storm event, there will be no discharge into the street. Currently, the parking lot just flows overland into the gutter. So this is a case when we can say more than just we're not, incre we're not increasing runoff. We're actually creating a significant benefit in regards to surface runoff and water quality. And that's one of the reasons that we're confident we'll have no problem getting permits from the Narragansett Bay Commission. Now, because we do have an underground infiltration system, we will need a stormwater permit from DEM. But we have, this, we have designed similar projects like this you know, for the past couple of decades. <laughs> And we briefly discussed the project with them and we see no technical reason that this would not be processed in a routine manner. In regards to drainage, another item I wanted to point out is that on the north side, which is in between the building and the adjacent pub, there is a walkway and to further minimize impact on drainage, what we're proposing is a series of permeable pavers so that if it's not being collected by the rooftop, the only surfaces will be the, those porous pavers, again, to minimize runoff on the adjacent area. The, the next item would be, I can hit on the landscape the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll touch on utilities. Uh, being an urbanized area, we do have access to public water, public sewer, public gas. We are proposing a domestic and fire service connection directly from Waterman Street. And there's an existing sewer stub from Wayland Ave that we're proposing to tie into. The electric service and gas will also tie in from Waterman. And the transformer will be located at the extreme northeastern corner at the back of the building. Okay. The next item I'll briefly touch on would be the landscaping on the next screen. Okay. Again, our landscape architect couldn't make it, but basically <coughs> the way we approached the project was, again, to make sure that we fully conform to the zoning requirements. And the, the primary concern is to make sure that for the C2 zone, we provide the adequate tree canopy of 15%. And in the zoning ordinance, we are allowed to take credit for the planting of street trees. And so as you can see, we've, we've located five street trees along Waterman Street. And those have been sized so that we're essentially double the city required canopy coverage of 15%. Now, in addition to the street trees, we also have approximately 90 feet of tree planters along Waterman Street and along the back of the building. And those will be planted with a, a mix of evergreens and you know, flowering shrubs. And the last landscaping component is it doesn't show on this plan but on the eastern side that borders the parking lot even though there won't be a formal planting beds there will be ivory that will be planted to you know to grow along the side of the building so that's a quick summary of the civil engineering issues a couple of questions before you go um the stormwater system do you have any water quality is there are there any oil water separators i didn't see them called out on the plan, the, you're the getting runoff from the garage and things like that. So I just wonder. Well, the benefit is that we, we're collecting the rooftop runoff, which doesn't have the, the water quality degradation issue. It doesn't have the sand or silt. But you have catch basins in the parking garage as well. We, we have one. And if it's not shown on the plan, we, we planned on having a, a hooded vent so that any floatables could be collected. Okay. Now, one of the benefits, well, one of the reasons that 
that will work is that the catch basin in the parking lot will not be exposed to rainfall. So there will not be a heavy wash of water entering it. Okay. The only water in the garage should be what happens to, you know, wind blown into the garage. And during the winter, if there's any snow melt coming off the garage, so there really will be minimal. So we do not believe that we need to have a formal designated, say, thousand gallon grease trap, but we will make sure that we do have a hood. And if you uh, if you applied for a DEM permit, they'll they'll take care of all that. Okay. If you if he's applied for a DEM permit, they'll they'll make sure he oh they will applies all applicable water quality treatments. Um, so you're waiting for Narragansett Bay Commission, DEM, and was there a third? Providence Water. Providence Water. That's not a state permit. It's really the DEM is the only state permit we're, we're going to be waiving. We don't normally, yes. I mean, Narragansett Bay Commission will usually waive as a matter of practice, yeah. but um, Providence Water is something you just need for final plan is my opinion. Yes. And, okay. Yeah, Providence Water is not a required element. Okay. I've got one more witness. Okay. Um, who's appearing by Zoom? We have Michael Cassidy. We just we just so, asked him to make it brief. This is a we have a, sure a, a, a long agenda tonight. We just want to make sure we get through everything. Okay. All right. We'll make it very brief. Thank you. <laughs> Michael, are you there? All right, Michael, you can unmute yourself and then uh, there you go. Turn on your camera. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, my, you want my name and address for the record? Name and address, please. Michael Cassidy, 92, Ames Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Okay. And um, we were asked to make it brief, so I'll just ask if... Um, how many years experience have you had as a municipal planner? 52. And have you been accepted as an expert by many other zoning and planning boards throughout Rhode Island? Yes, I have. Okay. And, and just for the record too, that those 52 years of experience um, include a lot of large city experience such as the city of Pawtucket, correct? Yes. Okay. And um, you have prepared a report which we've already submitted to the commission. And um, I'm just going to ask you to basically summarize your conclusion for them. Uh, yes, and I'll be very brief. Um, I was retained for my professional planning, planning consultant services to evaluate this request for a major land development project uh, to make sure it's conformance with the comprehensive plan. I've gone through the comprehensive plan and identified a number of objectives and goals that this uh, does meet, and it's all they're spelled out in my report. Um, they provide uh, additional uh, new units in Wayland Square, which is also along the transit corridor. Um, and they provide new housing development and they promote a, a balance of uh, sustainable patterns of development to provide healthy, walkable neighborhoods. Um, after my review of the comprehensive plan is my conclusion it's in, uh, and is my professional opinion that this application for a new mixed use commercial residential development building at 159 Whalen Avenue is in compliance with the requirements of the city's comprehensive plan. I also reviewed the zoning ordinance requirements and this applicant's proposed development plans are in compliance with all the city's zoning ordinance requirements for this type of development in the C dash two zone and no variances are required. Short and sweet. Thank you. And I would guess I would ask the commission if you had any questions of Mr. Cassidy um, or actually any of our witnesses because You're that's present. all we're, we're done. Okay. And then obviously they're responding to further questions Perfect. or if the public has comments. Um, well, I'll kick it off and then we'll, we'll pass it around to some other uh, members of the commission. Um, first in, in an overall, um, I actually like the higher density in your, your last uh, submission. So this is kind of sad for me. Um, seeing only 12 units in this large of a building, very large units, condominium, not my favorite thing, but I, I am appreciative of the, uh, the trials and tribulations this project has been through. So I understand the rationale. Um, what do you see the tenant space becoming? It's 1100 square foot tenant space. Do you see it as a, a restaurant, a 
a retail shop? No, we, we don't see it as a restaurant. It's, it's too small and it's not set up for hoods or anything like that. Um, so definitely not a restaurant. Um, some sort of um, small business could be a, you know, financial service, brokerage service, something like that. Um, that's kind of what we see it as. Could end up being a small retail establishment. Okay. Um, the, um, these kind of go hand in hand. Um, has the, the subdivision been recorded and the necessary easements that go along with that, or is that a part of this process? Um, I believe, yeah, it's all recorded. So the subdivision is recorded, there's yes. separate lots, the easements have been recorded. Yes, that's okay. correct. Um, so, I mean, we, we still have obligations um, as was referred to when, assuming that this is approved, when the funeral home is demolished, we have obligations to, because it's actually connected to right. the bride's pub, we have to create deconnect that them and we'll walk be connecting away that, and, that walkway between it. Um, so leading into that, the, the trash doors, how do you expect that trash to be serviced? So it's coming out of that, that easement area, sure. that five foot wide easement area in between the two buildings. Sure. It, it's actually, you know, not. Um, the way we're going to work that trash is there'll be a service that comes to the waterman side, or, you know, early in the morning where they're coming into the trash room, taking the trash out of that room, bringing it to their vehicle and taking it off site uh, on a regular basis, probably, you know, at least two or three times a week. Um, we, we don't see, we, we certainly do have no intention of bringing trash to Wayland Avenue. Um, and uh, we think that the, the way I just described it is the most appropriate way to remove trash from the property. So right now it looks like the only, well, there, there's a man door, I guess, to the garage. So you're saying you're gonna bring it out to the garage, through the garage, and right now there's a double door that faces Wayland and that's the most visible eyesore that I see when looking at your project on the elevations that you did is that double door that's the trash room from Wayland Avenue. Yeah, I mean, that, that trash door is 81 feet off of Wayland Avenue sidewalk. So it's it's very set back. It's just clear in the elevations because the, the views that we provided because of McBride's pub being silhouetted and not solid, okay. not opaque. Uh, understood, yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay. Um, the, we talked about the stormwater um, and then you're, you're going to obtain any encroachment permits necessary for those overhangs, I assume. All right, that's, that's, that's what I had. Pass it around to the rest of the commission. No questions from me. No questions. No questions besides, um, I, I do like the changes to some of the design because of some of the concerns that came up during the last meeting. Um, I'm also happy that you um, clarified on the GFA and the, um, eliminates us having to talk about an interpretation of the 40,000 square feet. So uh, makes it a little easier um, for, for discussion of this. So, um, so thank you. And oh, and I also want to give kudos for the, uh, the roof drainage system. Um, I don't think that was a topic of discussion before, but that's a good improvement to not add to the um, to, to any impact to the uh, surrounding area. Um, and I apologize, I didn't have a question. I did have one question just because it did come up during the last uh, um, time. The funeral home is not protected by any hyster historic uh, commission. So I want to make sure that folks here and um, at home understand that that's not, um, you know, it's not protected by any by any sort, but it did come up. Did you have any other further discussions about integrating that into your system? Because I know that that was something that was brought up a lot by some of the uh, neighbors. We, we did spend time talking about it in the studio, but just couldn't figure out how best to utilize the structure. Based on the needed footprint of the new structure, you can see how it would be really hard to build around um, the existing structure that's there. So also the, the, the pre-existing use was a little bit of a deterrent from a marketing standpoint for future residences of any kind. And we just couldn't make heads or tails of it. So we didn't spend a ton of time on it to be quite honest with you. Uh, thanks for addressing that. Okay. Um, I guess with that, we will um, we will hear the staff report from Troyon and then we'll open it up to public comment. So thank you very much for your presentation. Again, I, I mourn the loss of some more density in this building, but I'll have to live with that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And 
after going through the presentation, we would look at consistency with a comprehensive plan and we find that this development does conform, given that it's the sort of classical development that we like to see in this land use designation, which is neighborhood commercial mixed use. And we find that the building will conform to objective BE2 and H2 of the plan. Based on the applicant's presentation, we do find that uh, proposed mixed use, dimensions, parking, landscaping, and lighting all conform to the ordinance. We don't foresee a negative environmental impact. This will be a buildable lot and adequate pedestrian and vehicular access will be provided from Wayland Ave and Waterman Street. So based on that, we would first recommend that you grant the waiver from submission of state approvals as the applicant has requested. And we would recommend that you grant that waiver, making the finding that it is necessary and in the interest of good planning practice. And that should be granted with the condition that the applicant return to the commission if the approvals result in a change to the plan. Following that, we would recommend that you combine master and preliminary plan approval, finding that the applicant meets the requirements for both stages. And finally, we recommend that you would grant a combined master and preliminary plan approval subject to these conditions, that the landscaping plan be subject to the city forester's approval, the drainage plan be subject to the city engineer's review, that the applicant submit any necessary encroachment permits with the building permit application, and that final plan be delegated to the staff. Thank you, Choyam. Um, at this point, we'll ask the applicant to, um, to sit down uh, in, the, in the audience uh, because we're gonna be calling uh, a public and we only have one microphone up there to use. Uh, we will call you back up if we have any questions after public comment, but uh, thank you again for your presentation. And Are we okay over here? yeah, you're fine there. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. Um, it looks like I have four or so people from the applicants group, and the first person just confirmed this. Okay. All right. So uh, the first person here aside from the applicant is uh, Barry Preston. We'll, we'll invite you up. Thank you. Will I sit here? Yeah, just sit up there. Just make sure you talk into the microphone so that our viewers at home can hear you as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the planning board. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. So um, I am Barry Preston, live at 168 Medway Street in the neighborhood, I'm literally right around the corner from the project. Um, I might say that my favorite place to dine is McBride's Pub, so I know the area very well. Let me say that I am the uh, one of the objectors to the previous plan, and I'm very pleased to come here in strong support of this plan. Um, I'm very pleased to see that uh, Mr. Lewinstein and Mr. Gressinger listened to the neighbors and to the neighborhood and have crafted what I now think to my view, is a wonderful addition to our neighborhood. Notably, it now has a height and a mass that now fits into the neighborhood. And with all due respect to the Planning Commission, it is of a density, which I think is appropriate for this site and for this neighborhood. It responds, it recognizes that, this is in my humble opinion, that people in the city, particularly in this neighborhood, still own cars, still need parking spaces. Um, and I'm so very pleased to see that there are two parking spaces per unit, um, which I think will adequately serve the residents, the future residents of this, um, of this community. I think it recognizes that the city requirement for zoning one space is, would be insufficient in this particular area to provide for the parking necessary and, and therefore would not uh, create a burden on the rest of the neighborhood as to parking for people who would need to find parking outside the building. I think this also meets a, an unmet need in the neighborhood for housing, and so very pleased to see that. As a design, I think that 
the uh, developer and the architect have done a spectacular job here. I think this is a, a terrific building. I think it fits well into the neighborhood. Um, I compliment them on their design sense, on the, on the uh, articulation of the facade, on the materials that they're using. So I think this is going to be just a terrific neighbor, uh, addition. Plus, I might say that I think the um, addition of more street trees than are necessary is a terrific thing. Um, I don't think we can have enough street trees in the city of Providence, in my opinion. And I also think it's great that they've sort of greened the, uh, the exterior of the building in a, in a way that would be, would be quite challenging with the building that is um, uh, built uh, in the way it's built. So I just uh, can't say enough in support of it. And I hope the commission um, passes this through, grants the waivers, and that we have a new building on the site um, as quickly as we may have it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Presto. We may agree, disagree on the density, but we definitely agree on the canopy cover. So that's always good to know. Um, let's see if anyone at home uh, on the Zooms, on the interwebs would like to join us, please raise your virtual hand or press star nine if you are calling in. You can find your little virtual hand down at the bottom of middle of your screen. Going, going, and we will now close the public comment portion of this agenda item. And Mr. Chair, also just for the record, you did receive a letter from PPS that was sent to you early to, earlier today. That is correct. We all have that and have reviewed that in advance of this. Um, well, commissioners, we are here to uh, to talk about this. The first two things that we're going to have to decide is um, waiver of approvals and um, combining the stages. Obviously, this is pretty well engineered, so I, I think that the combining of stages is, is appropriate in this instance. Is there any other discussion we should have before we start rolling into this? I mean, I'm, I'd just like to echo your point. The lower density, more cars, not kind, kind of not with the, the spirit of the of comprehensive plan, but hey, can't win them all. <laughs> all right, I will start us off with some motions. That sounds good to me. I think the first motion is that we grant the waiver from submission of the state approvals. Um, and that they submit them with final plan and return to the CPC if the approvals result in a change in the plan. All right, so we have a motion on the table. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion. Uh, we'll go around and uh, do a voice vote. Miguel? Aye. Chris? Aye. Nicole? Aye. And I vote aye. Then I'll do a motion that we combine the master and preliminary plan. I think all the items have been submitted. Yep. Second. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Miguel? Aye. Chris? Aye. Nicole? Aye. And I vote aye. And then I will make a motion based on everything that we received and everything that we heard today um, that we approve the master and the preliminary plan subject to the following conditions. The landscaping plan shall be subject to the city foresters approval. The drainage plan shall be subject to the city engineers review. The applicant shall submit any required encroachment permits with the building permit application and final plan approval be delegated to DPD staff. Uh, just a question before we, we do a formal vote. Is there any need to extend the validity of this? No, as a, as a uh, validity. As a, as a major land development project, the, the uh, timeframes in state law are, are pretty generous. Okay. I think they have two years. For, Just wanted to make for, sure before we, we had a motion. On the for, and, and in fact, and in fact, well, yeah, I, suffice it to say. Okay. I'll second. All right. So we have a motion on the table. We'll do one more voice vote. Miguel. Aye. Chris. Aye. Nicole. Aye. And I vote aye. Best of luck. <laughs> to you as well. All right, we'll move right into the second agenda item on our agenda tonight, which is a major land development project. It's a uh, case number 22-041MA. It is a project located at 228 Broad Street. We'd invite the applicant up at this time. 
Thanks, commissioners. And while we wait for the applicant, a quick introduction. This is a sister project of a minor land development project that you saw a few months earlier. And the applicant is proposing to construct a mixed use development with commercial use on the ground floor in 80 units. 80, eight, eight zero. Okay. 80 units on the upper stories. It's gonna be five stories, 58 feet tall on lots that are mostly vacant. And in requesting, in requesting approval of this project, the applicant is, sure. the applicant is requesting to combine master and preliminary plan stages of review. They are also asking for certain design waivers. Those are from the, those are from the requirements of the minimum window sill height, as well as the amount of transparency on the ground floor. So yeah, the applicants here, we should note that this is zone C2 under the TOD overlay. So the applicant can tell us more for this. Thank you for coming back. And this is the part of the project that we weren't talking about the last time you were here. That is absolutely correct. Uh, Harry Angevine, CEO of Marathon Construction and Development. So Chairman, members of the board, pleasure to be here again and uh, present final phase of Copley Chambers. Uh, as you are all aware, Copley Chambers one is nearing its completion on Broad Street. We're very excited to uh, you know, be opening that up for occupancy, hopefully before Christmas of this year. Copley two, we have presented to you folks a couple of months ago and so forth. And really, this is the continuation of that same, you know, mantra of trying to provide housing that's affordable for the community. This building needs 60%, um, it, it, which really represents, you know, in better terms, rather than using numbers and AMIs and all those sorts of things. This is designed in a fashion to provide community housing for that neighborhood. You know, young folks leaving, you know, their parents' homes and, you know, starting out and low paying first job. This is a perfect location for them to be able to walk downtown to Providence, take advantage of all the area amenities, as well as, you know, the amenity that we're proposing on the first floor. So having said that, uh, I would, like to introduce Sam Hemingway from Garofalo Engineers uh, to give us a quick overview of the site design. Again, for the record, my name is Sam Hemingway. I'm a project engineer with Garofalo and Associates doing business in the province. Put your microphone closer. Can you say that? H E M E N W A Y, Hemingway. <coughs> Uh, so as shown on the, on the uh, side uh, up above, this, this project is kind of the left half of, of the, the property that's comprised of a number of lots. Uh, it's actually uh, four lots to the west of Summer Street, uh, fronting on Broad Street, and with Haskins uh, fronting on the left side or left side of the property. Uh, it is uh, proposed, uh, as was indicated, it's proposed primarily of a building structure. So uh, similar to the last uh, site that came before you, it's an urban site, there's very little exterior and site improvements. I'm gonna try and be brief on those, and but but we'll talk a little bit about what is proposed. Uh, so there's a, a, a service area that is proposed off of uh, Haskins uh, Street uh, that will provide a uh, delivery uh, location for the property. Uh, as well as utility services being a, a transformer location and the like. Uh, there is a, a ramp access to, to, the, to a central lobby of the building, which we talked about uh, a little bit more uh, coming up. Uh, the project also proposes uh, 13 interior parking spaces. So um, it, because the property falls within the transportation overlay district, the parking, there is no parking requirement for the, for the actual use being proposed. Uh, those spaces are going, as I understand it, are going to be assigned uh, to the tenant on the first floor. Uh, again, the people are more versed at, at the, the, the occupants of the building, but, but uh, certainly that is the intent there. The, the parking spaces are accessed from Summer Street, uh, so there is a one-way in and a one-way out from that. That's a, it's a, uh, a low-volume street uh, off of Broad, so 
obviously safe turning movements and the like uh, uh, with that uh, process. The building will be uh, uh, served by public utilities, again, urban site, uh, public water on, on three sides. Uh, we're anticipating uh, a connection of a domestic and a fire protection service line, a similar last application, uh, and connection to public sewer. Uh, also similar to the, the uh, last application, we are proposing uh, subsurface infiltration components. Uh, at the way that this project is set up, uh, those components do not require state permitting based on the area of rooftop going to them. Uh, but in the <coughs> general principle, certainly the design requirements uh, will be the same. Uh, the, the testing that was uh, done to uh, ensure the subsurface conditions has, has been completed. Uh, and the system is currently being reviewed uh, through uh, drainage citywide and NBC drainage design uh, reviews. So uh, we have submitted to NBC and actually have gotten the first round of comments and are coordinating to, to work that information out. Uh, we have submitted down to engineering. Uh, they've brought up some minor points which we similar will work to resolve. Uh, we have uh, requested that those applications be waived. Again, there is no state application that's a pseudo state being um, NBC province water and engineering division, uh, similar on the curb cut application. Uh, this, the single curb cut that's being proposed, proposed for the, the truck circulation uh, is new uh, and slightly modified, but the project does propose new sidewalks around the entire perimeter, at least the street frontage perimeters. Uh, to the extent that it is feasible, we are going to try and maintain the existing street trees in all likelihood that means removing and, and staging them for a time and then replacing them. Uh, but certainly the entire frontage will receive new street trees, making it significantly exceeding the, the, uh, the canopy requirement of the city. So again, wholly compliant to the, to the zoning ordinance and, and the, uh, the requirements, the development requirements that are established for the lot. Uh, there are <coughs> some minor uh, additional um, uh, waivers that are required and will be uh, address, I guess, at this point regarding the building. So hopefully that's clear from the 10,000 foot level. Obviously I'm here and, and you can take as deep as you'd like into the technical requirements, but uh, not a complex civil engineering requirement. It's wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Greatly appreciate it. At this point, I'd like to introduce Virginia Branch, uh, architect for our project, and I'd like her to take us through the uh, site rendering, the elevations of the building. And I'll make sure you can hear me okay. Is this close enough? Okay, thanks. Virginia branch, like a tree, and it's branch architects. <laughs> um, so um, our, our rendering here, um, hot off the presses, we've been able to really focus on tying together the materials for the, the two new buildings with respect to the original building and thinking about the street as a whole there's a lot of masonry and warm tones on the street so we've really focused in on that as an expression um, obviously wanting the first floor to be um, as transparent as possible our focus for the layout of the first floor is currently a community um, health center um, and we've done our best to keep the, as much of the glazing uh, transparent as possible. So here at the, the corner, we've got the reception area and lobby with an enormous amount of glass, something like what we see here, where very tall floor and um, maximizing the amount of glass there. Um, and then at the other end, we also have another space that's um, visualized as a conference room, meeting room. Um, so we've got the corners that are very transparent. And then we created a ribbon of glass that we'll, we'll talk a little bit more from some other views, but wanted you to get a sense of the a patterning that we're working with where we have some clear glass, some transparent glass. So I guess I'll categorize it as translucent, transparent and opaque. And the idea is that this ribbon would be a storefront system and that some of the panels would be opaque. Um, we're playing around with color that, that's not really illustrated here, but with, you know, as we get along further, we'll be playing with color 
and that material and then the translucent glass would be would have some sort of a backing so you would still see light come through it at night and then then the transparent glass obviously um so here you see the main entrance to uh, our the tenant that we're working with now um, is the community health center and the lobby and then Upstairs we have, we're actually over the amount of transparency with the amount of windows that we're providing. But the way that we calculated the transparency on the first floor, um, we have 29.2 transparent, which is the actual clear glass. Um, six and a half percent is translucent. And then we have 26.5 that's opaque. Um, so I think the, the requirement Choyan, you may have to help me. It's 50%, is that correct? Bob's 50% not. Of the um, so while we're under that, I think that the effect and the design that we're proposing um, accommodates for that deficiency. Can I can I ask a question? Is yeah. it is it mainly by design of the of the tenant that's going to be occupying right. that area? I, I think um, our layout is preliminary with the clinic, but no matter what we do, there will be exam rooms on the exterior wall. And so our concept is that where we have those rooms, it's nice to have light. And so if we can put some clear glass up high and then have a, a translucent glass below that still provides privacy and comfort if you're inside and you're in a gown or something like that, you want, you want it to be comfortable, obviously. Um, so there's no real getting around that fact right now with the tenant that we're, um, we're speaking with. But the way that this will be designed, if there were a different tenant that came in, those opaque panels could be swapped out for transparent glass. Okay. The idea is that it's modular. Thank you. Um, and then finally, with regard to that, um, there was a requirement for sill height. Um, the nature of the site, it is sloping, and we're, we're working to make the finished floor of the building accessible at the entrance to the to the clinic and so that brings our window our window sill height up a little bit there and then again because it's a clinic we don't we just prefer not to have windows down at the 24 24 inches I think is what was required we're at um, three foot six I'm going to double check that yes so from grade and because grade is sloping, that's part of what drives that to be a little bit um, above what would be conforming. So I think, do we have other slides you want to go through? Yes, we can go ahead. Yeah. Go yeah. So typically, um, the, the upper floors are residential, four floors of residential. At the first floor, you can see the parking that Sam was talking about, where we've got an in, in, along, and then out. And then the front, all of the entire front space on Broad Street is the tenant space. We have a lobby that comes in for the, the residential on Summer Street. And our design is to make that as much of a highlight for the building as the entrance to the uh, commercial space. I think we can move ahead. Yep. Um, I gave you just some updated elevations from what you received in the package. Um, we, just because we are continuing to play around with materials, there's no impact to our furthering of our design for, for, your, for the, what we've talked about for the variances. Um, but we're, we're um, looking at um, a brick uh, cladding. Uh, it's a cementitious panel with a brick look that will be at the ground floor. And then a mix of, of cement panels above. And we're playing around with, as I discussed, warmer colors, but with um, pop of sort of um, yellow sandstone color in the middle. And that's playing off of the natural brick color of 206. You can see here in the bottom right, that is the entrance at the corner for the residential unit. So we've got a a pop of color there and a lot of glass as you come into the residential apartment. And then this isn't showing up as well on this bright screen, but going along Summer Street, the, the facade of the garage, we're taking cues from the front, playing around with panels of 
different types of mesh so that light from inside um, will show through at night within from the garage and then same it allows light and fresh air into the garage. So, I mean, just to remind everybody of what we're talking about, I mean, this, um, when I'm speaking about 206, you can see it there and it's, it's interesting, the facade of the building is a, a sort of a tannish, a warm brick, and then the back is a red brick. So that's what sort of led us into the direction of this warmer pattern. Yep. So out of the um, the 80 units, uh, what is your total unit mix of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms? Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Uh, studios, we're looking at 12. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was looking at yeah, the total uh, phases <laughs> two and three. Excuse me, folks. <laughs> um, we've got eight studios, um, eight studios, 56 one bedrooms, and 16 two bedrooms. Okay, thank you. Total of 80. <clears throat> Did you have anything else, or are you ready to take questions from the commissioner? I think we're ready to take okay. questions. Um, that, that, was, that was my, uh, my biggest question. Um, any of the other commissioners wish to speak to the applicant, ask any questions at this time before we hear the staff report and open up the public comment? No questions for me. No questions. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, at this point, we'll, we'll hear the staff report and we'll bring you up if we have any other questions after uh, public comment. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And having seen the applicant's presentation, we can say that the project is in conformance with the comprehensive plan. Again, this is on a commercial corridor under the TOD overlay. And the mixed use, next, this is in a commercial corridor under the TOD overlay. And the development that you see conforms to the type of development that is prescribed by the plan. And also this would conform to objectives H2 and H3 of the plan, which encourage building new and affordable housing. Mixed use development is permitted by right in the C2 zone under the TOD overlay. The, the development will conform to the dimensional requirements of the overlay as they will with parking and landscaping. We don't foresee a negative environmental impact they have included drainage and erosion control plants. This will be a buildable lot subject to the applicant merging them prior to, prior to a final plan approval. Adequate access will be provided from Broad and Summer Streets. And based on that, we would recommend that you first vote on the waiver from submission of state approvals and we recommend that they be granted that you grant that waiver finding that they're required and in the interest of good planning practice. So then we would proceed to the design waivers where again we would recommend that you grant those waivers for first floor transparency and sill height finding that they are needed due to the nature of the use of the first floor commercial use. Then we would recommend that you combine master and preliminary plan approval and then that you approve the master and preliminary plan subject to these conditions that the applicant apply for an administrative subdivision to merge the lots and also on the plan there were there was a projecting sign that appeared to be conceptual but if the applicant wishes to go ahead with that we would ask that the applicant include a include a signage plan that includes the proposed dimensions. And the landscaping plan shall be subject to the city forester's approval. Drainage calculation shall be subject to the city engineer's approval. The applicant shall obtain any necessary encroachment permits prior to final plan submission. And that finally, we ask that final plan approval be delegated to DPD staff. Okay. Um... If you would like to comment on this and you're joining us virtually, uh, 
please raise your hand, your virtual hand, or press star nine if you are calling in. And we do have uh, one person from the audience here who would like to speak on this matter, and that's Councilwoman Mary Kay Harris. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, first of all, for having me tonight. My name is Mary Kay Harris. I represent Ward 11, in which this housing complex will be in my neighborhood. So I come tonight to speak on the behalf of uh, affordable housing and what the need is in Providence. I I'm only concentrating on Providence. We do know that throughout Rhode Island, we, we have a housing shortage. I myself have been an advocate and a push uh, advocate to push for affordable housing. I'd like to say tonight that I am here tonight to fully support um, this housing development that would be uh, a part of my neighborhood. I want to speak on the fact that uh, when we think about sometime affordable housing and low income housing, there's a different AMI for each and every one of you know, the sector of housing. One of the things I wanna say that right now in, in that same district, in that same area, we have some very low income residents. Some have shelters and some are housed uh, at a very low income and most are homeless around also in that area. I believe with these housing being at the AMI of 60 to 80% income, or 60, let's leave it at 60%. I, I, I definitely have uh, another developer who said he would like to build at 80%. I would love to see him go to 60%, simply because um, there is a lot of students that are leaving school and have left home. And a lot of them do have income. They are able to make money, but no house, no, no place to live. What's beautiful about this area this area is also um, in the vicinity of downtown Providence, the highway, and also um, our schools and the hospital. And so for me, for uh, new residents to uh, move there, it, it would be an opportunity to appreciate good space that are right on the bus line. And again, we have to respect the schools that also are very much in, uh, directly in front of this property. I do like the idea of a community health center also in that area. Um, you know, during the time of COVID, we were running around looking for space in our neighborhood that would accommodate, you know, uh, our very intelligent doctors that's practicing there in the neighborhood, but however, wasn't able to find space to, you know, absolutely uh, be able to accommodate people. Uh, I like the idea of that. I think my only concern I have as far as this project is the parking because it's so little parking. It seems like it's great to have 80 units, but uh, some reason or other people are still driving. I don't know why. I mean, the cost of gas and cost of cars, but a lot of people still have um, cars and they do drive. So I think the only thing I would say about this project is um, that it is, you know, with the parking, I would like to question that. And maybe it probably don't need that much parking. I don't really know, but um, because of the bus line, but I do know, I do, I think about that. I think it's a little, I have a little concern around that. I also like to say that uh, the developer have had conversations with uh, Southside Neighborhood Association which I appreciate because that's a base in my neighborhood who has a watchful eye, you know, for me, because I, my, my work inside is usually really busy and I, I don't always have the pulse of the community. So I appreciate the community who have brought this to my, actually the community Southside Neighborhood uh, Association and other groups have brought this project to my attention. As you all know, I was running for election and I was just, I disappeared for a while. However, this is an opportunity for our community to have some decent housing. So I would hope that the developer would uh, continue to invest, bring in great management and um, 
for us to be able to have an opportunity for some decent affordable housing. So thank you for allowing me to speak before you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. We appreciate you being here tonight. Okay. Um, that's the only person in the room that we've seen uh, to speak on this matter that's signed up. So we'll go to our virtual world and the interwebs and see who is waiting there. Okay, we, we have uh, one person, Yadira Rivera, who should uh, pop up. Okay, Yadira, you are promoted. Um, you can um, unmute yourself. Uh, please state your name, uh, address for the record. Sure, uh, Jadira Rivera, and I'm also here with my sister, Jemini Rivera, and we are at 326 Dudley Street. Um, we are also known as the Twins, in case anyone, I don't know, might have heard of the Twins, but figured I'd just outline that. So, I, what I wanted to um, say is that we- Mary Kay Harris confirms that she knows who the Twins are. Okay. <laughs> Yes, and um, we are proud residents in Ward 11, where Mary Kay, um, Councilwoman Harris, excuse me, um, is, is an amazing person to serve our community. So um, we felt compelled to join this evening, unfortunately, from the Boston area, sorry, and not in person, or we would have been there, to say that we um, fully actually support uh, this project and, um, and are really, really pleased to have engaged with Harry um, Anjan, I apologize if I didn't say your last name correctly, but uh, he and Marathon have engaged with the community in a way that we unfortunately aren't confident enough to say that other um, agent, social service agencies or developers have. We've um, attended a number of SPNA meetings, which is South Providence Neighborhood Association meetings, where they have actually showed us some of the plans prior to actually having started the project. And it's more of an approach of, hey, this is what we're thinking of doing, what do you think, versus this is what's happening, catch up, accept it, and um, let's move on. And that's an approach that I have to say is welcomed and one that models what it means to be a good neighbor in regards to a social service agency or developers along with neighbors, which again, I'll highlight, we unfortunately haven't been able to say for other people in the area. Um, the one thing I did would love to highlight, and I know we've talked to Harry about this, is I we don't see a lot of green space incorporated in this project. And I know in the past we've talked with Harry because we live across the street from the Jackie Clements Park, which in fact is one that has demonstrated a lot of um, problems. And we're working along with um, it's Councilwoman Harris and the Parks Department to and also the Amos House to really work towards that because of the limited green space in the area people tend to conjugate in one area and you get a lot of behaviors that aren't really safe or one that we would like to see on a daily basis so it would be nice to see a little green space incorporated and at some point or in some way uh having said that though I have to say that Marathon and Harry himself have demonstrated uh just this really empathetic way of engaging with the community and one that we welcome. We recently had a Ward 11 safety meeting where Harry did attend. Harry has invited a number of residents and we're happy to be joining a future tour of the site. One, like I said, that no, no one else has shown. And I think this is, it models, like I said, a great way where agencies and developers can really engage with residents and create that partnership that is so important for moving forward, especially as we continue to evolve. So that's a long way for me to say thumbs up from the twins and we um, fully support this project. Thank you for listening. You know, thank you for, uh, for chiming in this evening. And we'll go again to see if there's anyone else from the virtual public that would like to speak on this matter. Not seeing any hands right now. All right, then with that, we will close the public comment portion of this agenda item. Um, so I, I guess, excuse me, Commissioner, just for the record, y'all received a letter from the South Providence Neighborhood Association in support. Yes, we sent out to you earlier today. We all received and read that letter in advance of this meeting. So that will be attached to the record. Um, I think I'd like to start off by, by thanking the applicant for the community outreach that you, you did previous to you appearing here today and the stewardship of your project. That really 
that makes a big difference um, when when the community knows about what you're doing and they feel like they get some buy-in. Um, thank you very much for doing that. It's not a requirement that we have, but we always appreciate it when that happens. Um, I I, uh, I do agree with the uh, the staff report and the that the applicant is trying to meet the intent of the waivers they're they're asking for relief on and. Uh, I think they, they've done a, a good job in that. And I guess the only other thing that I'll ask is um, maybe that the applicant can uh, can work with the city parking coordinator if um, if there is a need for off street parking permits. There have been some instances where multifamily developments have been uh, awarded off street parking permits for um, things that are that are not normally apply uh, allowed um, if there's an excess of, of street parking in the area. So that may be one way to uh, to, to allow more parking without adding more to your site because it looks like it's pretty constrained already. Um, any other discussion from the commissioners? I just want to echo what you mentioned. And you know, so I really appreciate the councilwoman and also the, the twins um, <laughs> coming to speak because so often folks that are in favor of projects don't come out and folks that are against do. And I think it also speaks volumes to the applicant that folks feel so passionately and appreciative of the work that you did to really collaborate with the community. Um, and so I'm really, as a commissioner, excited to see it. I think it's always that type of real genuine community involvement leads to better projects. Um, and I think we're seeing that here. And so I'm really grateful for those who came out tonight to testify and support. And um, I'm excited to, su to support this project. Thank you, Nicole. Chris? No comment. Okay. Here we go. And it doesn't really need to be uh, repeated, but I, I also echo uh, the sentiments. Um, I think we find ourselves kind of as the middle person sometimes where it's like developers on one side, community on the other, and it doesn't have to be that way. Not everything has to be agreed upon, obviously, but at least that, that there is a respect to listen to each other and see how things could be incorporated so that the mutual beneficiaries in these projects. So, so thank you for going above and beyond and incorporating the community in your design and in your communications. Um, and um, I also, I do agree to, to a certain degree with uh, Councilwoman Harris about the parking, but um, because of this being on, you know, rapid transit with the R1 line, it's not uh, required. Um, as of now, I don't think there's a lot of parking need on Broad Street, which is why I assume the patients will have to use because you don't want them to have to park too far, depending on their ailments going to the PCHC. Um, but uh, but that's also a welcome. That's not a condition for this project, but that's but it is, it is a a welcomed um, um, uh, tenant to have. Um, I think there there is a need for that, especially with the increase um, units there and other people in the neighborhood. They don't have to now go to necessarily lifespan and have to might be closer to their homes. So uh, thank you, and I'm in support of this project as well. Okay. Then we have a few different votes we're going to have to take on this project tonight. The first will be the recommendation of a waiver from submission of state approvals at the preliminary plan stage. So moved. Second. All right, we'll go around. Miguel? Aye. Chris? Aye. Nicole? Aye. And I vote aye. Um, the next one is a design waiver, and I'd like to add a little tweak to the recommendation for that one, and that is um, if we grant the design waiver and the, uh, the health clinic doesn't materialize for some way, that the applicant look for ways to meet the transparency requirements. Um, but having said that, that, that can be a part of the, the, uh, the I guess we'll, we'll, we'll say that we recommend waiver from transparency and sill height, um, and that if the based on the tenant, based on the tenant, if if it's yeah. if they're able to meet the requirement, they look for ways to do so. Can can we make a motion depending on a tenant for design? Well, you could. Um, because we're granting the waiver if you make this, but we're also asking for them. The reason the reason they're asking for the waiver is because of the tenant. So I think it's I think it's totally fair if the tenant doesn't materialize that they should at least attempt 
to uh, mm -hmm. comply with the transparency requirement. And, and I think we heard the I think we heard the applicants say that they that they would do that. And they and they're shaking their heads that they they don't disagree with. So the moved. Intent. All right. Second. Wonderful. <laughs> we'll go around with a voice vote. Miguel. Aye. Christian. Aye. Nicole. Aye. And I vote aye. All right. The uh, the next recommendation is a combination of the stages of approval. So moved. <laughs> Second. Second. <laughs> I think Nicole beat you on that one. Miguel. Aye. Christian. Aye. Nicole. Aye. And I vote aye. And then the final would be. I'll make a motion to come uh, to you approve master and preliminary <laughs> plan based on everything we heard today and everything that was submitted subject to the following conditions apply for an administrative subdivision to merge the lots signage plan indicating the types and dimensions of the proposed signage, landscaping plan subject to city foresters approval, drainage calculations shall be subject to the city engineer's approval, the applicant shall obtain necessary encroachment permits prior to permit submission. Actually, I think that should be final plan submission. Well, sometimes we, we, we do like to, to put in for that particular one permit submission because um, sometimes, um, sometimes the developers don't have it at final plan. Fair enough, then we'll keep it as, as read. And final plan approval shall be delegated to DPD staff. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. What was the, what is the one before this last one? The fifth one is the applicant shall obtain necessary encroachment permits prior to permit submission, just as drafted in the staff report. Second. All right. We have a motion on the table. Miguel. Aye. Christian. Aye. Nicole. Aye. And I vote aye. Thank you. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank you very much, folks. Now we'll move right into the next agenda item, which is agenda item number three. It's a city council referral. It's referral number 3533 for 115 Harris Avenue. Well, thanks, Mr. Chair. And this is a request to rezone the subject property from M1 to MMU 90. This building is currently vacant and it was formerly used as a lounge. And so the applicant is requesting the change in order to allow for development of multifamily housing on the site, which is not permitted under the M1 zone. So applicants here, they can tell us more. It's um, John Long, the attorney for 115 Harris Avenue, the owner of the property. Um, the staff report was very good. It's, we want to develop this as some type of residential use. Uh, I would point out where on one side of us is the Providence Journal printing plant. Then uh, the neon development that you've approved uh, that include, may include partly a residential component. On the other side of us is the 903. And across the street from us is the uh, shops at Providence Place, which is at least planned to be residences. So we think that rezoning this is consistent with the comprehensive plan, uh, wouldn't have any adverse impact on any of the uh, neighbors uh, and would be a good use for the property. We've also, it's just not feasible to redevelop it as an industrial building. It's got really high ceilings. It's got um, zero parking. Uh, it's got the railroad tracks for the uh, that the province journal uses to get its newspapers uh, delivered on one side, the newsprint delivered on one side, and the other side is the uh, province journal property. So it's a small landlocked building in need of a lot of work. Okay. I might add that that it is uh, directly adjacent to the MMU zone to the east and to the south. Any questions of the applicant before we None hear the staff me. report? No. No. Okay. Then let's uh, let's hear the staff report. Sure, commissioners. And as you you saw in the map and as described by the applicant, this this particular lot is under the what would be considered the business mixed use development land <laughs> use designation yeah. of the comprehensive plan, which allows for multifamily development in certain areas, and 
given that the plan envisions this area as one with industrial as well as multifamily commercial uses, the change would be in conformance with the comprehensive plan. As you saw on the map, MMU 90 is directly adjacent to this property. So including this lot within the MMU 90 zone would conform to the zoning ordinance as well as objective H2 of the comprehensive plan, which encourages development of new housing. So based on that, we find that rezoning this lot would be appropriate, just given the character of the surroundings and the proposed use. It's in conformance with the purposes of zoning and the comprehensive plan. And we recommend that you make a positive recommendation to the city council to rezone the MMU 90. Thank you very much. Um, this is a public uh, hearing. So if there is anyone from the public joining us virtually that would like to speak on this, please raise your virtual hand or press star nine if you're calling in. Um, I see no one on the sign in sheet here in person. I'll do one last call to. There is no one online and there are no attendees in person, so we will close the public comment portion of this agenda item. Any uh, discussion from the commissioners? I think this is a pretty straightforward city council recommendation. Um, it looks appropriate. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, recommend that the city council approve the proposed uh, zone change to MMU 90. Second. We have a motion on the table. Miguel? Aye. Christian? Aye. Nicole? Aye. And I vote aye. Thank you very much. Good luck at City Council. Thank you. We'll move right into uh, item, agenda item number four. It is case number 22-058MI. It's a minor land development project located at 327 Elmwood Avenue. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So, Commissioner, some of you may remember a previous iteration of this project, which at the same site, which at the time was a six story multifamily building. The applicant has returned with a different plan, and they're proposing to construct a five story, 58 foot tall multifamily dwelling in the C2 zone that will provide 32 units. In constructing this building, they are requesting a dimensional adjustment of one story and eight feet to accommodate the proposed height. And you will see that this is on a corner lot and they are construct a, a corner lot at the corner of Elmwood Ave and Burnett Street. And they are considering Burnett Street to be the front yard and Elmwood Ave the side yard. And in doing so, they are requesting a dimensional adjustment from the side yard setback requirement from the adjacent residential zone, <coughs> I'm sorry, from the adjacent residential zone. And they're also requesting a design waiver from the front yard bill to requirement on Burnett Street. So the applicants here and they can walk us through the project as well as the requested adjustments and waivers. Um, uh, we have Donald Alexis and, and Donald, um, is there anybody else from your team that you want us to be uh, promoting? Yes, uh, uh, yes, Laura from Davis Square. Uh, Laura CM. Yes. Okay, yeah, I see. Okay, great. Thank you for raising your hand and helping us out there. No, no problem, thank you. All right, Donald, uh, you can go ahead. Laura will be uh, promoted momentarily. Okay, okay, good go. evening. Good, uh, good evening, everyone. So, uh, as Sean mentioned, you probably remember this project. So I'm with the Caribbean Integration Community Development. We're a nonprofit doing affordable housing in Boston and Providence. Um, so we won that lot from a city RFP back in 2019. And the first time we came before you was uh, 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 the idea we discussed with the city at first was for a senior housing or one bedrooms. But when we went to the uh, Wood Island Housing Tax Credit funding round, so the size of the project in all one bedroom wasn't, uh, uh, um, we couldn't score high enough in the funding round to get all the funding we needed. So we went back last year and went twice. And so we, uh, and that was the same issue. So now with construction costs and interest rate getting, uh, um, you know, going higher, 
we had a um we had discussed with the city uh, uh, uh pra to actually change this project all over to make sure that we can create a more um a a, a well balanced development that can be um uh funded to the tax credit in the state um again it will be 32 units 100 percent affordable all rental and this lot it's under 10,000 square feet and that will be uh, uh, um there's no parking needed because that will be under the the new zoning so any lot under 10,000 square feet doesn't need parking so uh, um I'm going to let Laura uh, take over for me that she can walk us to the uh, to the site plan and also the programming of the development. Great, thank you, Donald, and thanks everyone for your time. I'm going to quickly walk through the plans that were submitted to the board members, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, the project is pretty straightforward, and other than the unit size change and it being a shorter building is not too much different than what you've seen before. So the site is at 372 Elmwood Ave. And um, we included a little- Before you go any further, can we just get your full name for the record, please, and, and the architecture firm you're with? Yes, uh, my name is Laura Chelamowit, and I'm with Davis Square Architects. We're located in Somerville, Mass. Thank you, sorry for the interruption. No problem. So this is a, a quick overview of the, the project and the relief that we're seeking, um, which is limited to building height and front and side and rear setbacks. Other than that, the project is in conformance. Overall, as Donald said, we're proposing 32 family units on five floors with a total gross square footage of just under 35,000. Here's a view of the proposed building in the aerial context. Again, a five-story building that takes up much of the lot and um, is built pretty close to the corner of Elmwood Ave and Burnett Street. Zooming in on the site plan a bit, and I'll zoom in here so we can read some of the dimensions. So this is where you can see some areas where we're requesting relief. As Choyan said, we're establishing Burnett as our front. So we're seeking relief for the build to area for the front, as well as the build to area, which is highlighted in green for both Burnett Street, our front, and Elmwood Ave, our side elevation. And we're also seeking relief for rear setback. We're proposing five feet where 10 feet are required because we're next to a residential zone. Just wanna make uh, clear on that. You're, you, you pointed to the wrong yard. Um, the, the, the northerly lot line abuts a commercial zone. It's the, the westerly right where you're circling there. So That's our right. chart, thank you for that yeah, clarification. Just, our chart might be wrong then because I think I referred to it as the rear, but it's actually a side setback in that case. Yeah, it, it just just so everybody understands this, we're, we're, we're there's a little bit of of um, of uh, kind of counterintuitiveness to the way this building is being interpreted on the site in order to get it to as close to zoning compliance as possible. You might think Elmwood, Elmwood Avenue would be considered the front because the building's address is on Elmwood, and that's the the primary um, the primary frontage. Uh, but for zoning purposes, uh, the the zoning requires in this zone a twenty foot setback from a residential zone uh, in the rear yard, um, but it requires ten feet. Uh, from the side, I think it's 10 feet from the side yard. So you can you can grant a dimensional, you, you, there's no dimensional adjustment that you could grant that would get them compliant if um, that westerly lot line was considered to be the rear yard. So um, for, 
So we were, we're, we're being creative here and we're interpreting that Burnett is the, the front yard. So the, the left side of the picture there is considered the side yard setback. At the same time, Elmwood Avenue is considered a main street. So there is this requirement that, that there be no residential or parking on the ground floor within 20 feet of the main street. So while El Elmwood Avenue is considered the main street, Burnett Street is considered the, the front for purposes of, of zoning compliance. And it looks like the, the, the plan you submitted, A101, does have the correct references to rear and side yard setback. I, I, I believe so. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, moving on to the floor plans. So again, five stories. The, the first floor includes some amenity space that opens up to Elmwood as well as Burnett Street. And those amenity spaces include a small fitness room, the top corner here, a generous lobby with space for mail, an office for an on-site property manager with a restroom, and then a lounge and laundry area, which will be for the residence use, which again opens out to Burnett Street and this yard space. Uh, there are four units on the first floor and the residential section of the floor is raised three feet above the elevation of the amenity spaces. The amenity spaces are at grade with the sidewalk. The upper floors all stack and there are seven units on each floor. It's a mix of four studios, I'm sorry, four two bedrooms, one studio and two three bedrooms. So again, the total comes to 32. Here's our overall mix. And then we'll quickly move to elevations. So we're also asking for relief for elevations. We had previously under a, an earlier iteration received relief for a six story building. Um, that relief has expired. So we're asking again for relief on building height. This zone permits four stories and 50 feet. We're asking for five stories and 58 feet. And that was it for the quick overview of the plans. I'm happy to answer any design related questions or give you more details as it will be helpful. So I'll hand it back over. Okay, um, with that, do, do the commissioners have any questions of the applicant before we hear the staff report or open it up to public comment? No questions from me. No questions. No. All right, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we're going to uh, hear the staff report at this time and then we'll take public comment. And if we have anything else, we will, uh, we will call you back for questions later. Sure, thanks, Mr. Chair. And before we get into the findings, I'd just like to talk a little bit more about the dimensional adjustments and the design waiver. So as you saw, Elmwood Ave was considered the, Elmwood Ave is considered the side yard and they are requesting a dimensional adjustment of five feet from the internal side setback on Burnett Street because they're required to maintain a 10 foot interior side setback from the residential zone. But in this case, they will be providing five. And they are also asking for a dimensional adjustment for height in the amount of eight feet and one story, 50 feet and four stories being the maximum permitted in the C2 zone. And we would recommend that you grant those adjustments, finding that they will be providing moderate and affordable housing. And that is one of the criteria that allows you to grant that adjustment. As far as the design waiver goes, you will know that buildings are required to be within five, within the five, within a five foot built to zone of the front lot line. In this case, as you can see on the plan, they will be close to 18 feet. And over 60%, they're required to maintain at least 60% to be within that built to zone, but about 75% will be outside of that required built to zone. And as you can see, the applicant will be providing green space within that 
front yard area, which is something that is not typically required to be provided into this in the C2 zone. So given that they're providing that, we would recommend that you grant the design waiver. And as you will know, there is an entrance from Burnett Street, which is required in the C2 zone direct access from the front. So based on that, we find the plan to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. This is, an, this is intended for neighborhood commercial uses per the future land use map of the comprehensive plan. And it's in conformance with objectives H2 and H3, creation of new and new diverse and affordable housing stock. Multifamily development is permitted by right in the C2 zone. And the development largely conforms the dimension requirements of the C2 zone with, with the exceptions of the height, side yard setback and design waiver, which we recommend that you grant. They will be providing landscaping, but we ask that the plan be reviewed by the city for so, but it appears that they will exceed the canopy coverage requirement. We don't foresee a negative environmental impact. This is a buildable lot and adequate pedestrian access is provided from Elmwood Ave and Burnett Street. So based on that, we would recommend that you grant the dimensional adjustment for additional story and eight feet of height, that you grant the dimensional adjustment for the side yard setback, and also that you grant the design waiver for over 60% <coughs> of the front yard being located outside of the Bill 2 zone. And finally, we would ask that you, or recommend that you approve the preliminary plan subject to these conditions that the validity of the preliminary plan be extended to one year from the 90 day expiration of the recorded approval letter. And the applicant has submitted a written request asking for that. The landscaping plan shall be subject to the city forester's approval. And finally, we ask that final plan approval be delegated to our DVD staff. And I, I just wanna make sure that it was absolutely clear. Um, I believe the applicant spoke of variances. There are no variances requested here. There were there are dimensional adjustments and design waivers as stated in the staff report. So that's, just for clarity. That's correct. Um, so with that, we will open it up to public comment. Um, if there's, there's no one signed up here, anyone here in person to speak on this matter. And if you're joining us virtually, please raise your virtual hand or press <laughs> star nine if you're calling in. And we don't see anyone yet going, going, and gone. All right, we will close the public comment portion of this agenda item. Commissioners, any discussion on this one? No. Okay. Then we'll go right into the, the votes that are needed. Um, so we're going to have three votes that are going to be needed tonight. Uh, dimensional adjustment, design waiver, and preliminary plan approval. Correct, Bob? Yes. Okay. All right. So we'll start with the first one, which is a dimensional adjustment, height and side yard setback, um, as stated in the staff report. So moved. I think that works. Is it close yes. enough, Lisa? Yes, it does. <laughs> All right. Second. Wonderful. All right. Uh, let's take a voice vote. Miguel. Aye. Christian. Aye. Nicole. Aye. And I vote aye. And the second vote would be uh, the design, design waiver. waiver. I'd make, make a motion for the, um, that the CPC should grant the design waiver for over 60% of the front yard being located out of the Bill 2 zone. Thank you, Christian. Second. All right. We have a motion on the floor. Miguel. Aye. Christian. Aye. Nicole. Aye. And I vote aye. The final. I'll make a motion so to approve the preliminary plan subject to the following conditions. Yep. The validity of the preliminary plan should be extended for one year from the 90 day expiration of the recorded approval letter. The landscaping plan shall be subject to the city foresters approval and final plan approval should be delegated to DPD staff. All of this is based on what we heard today and what was presented in the record. I second that. All right. Uh, before we take a voice vote, I just want to let the applicant know that you are able to come back for an extension of your approval. Uh, before it expires, if uh, the last time, I guess that didn't happen, um, you have one year now. So if, if it looks like it's not firming up, you can come back and, and talk to us again. So let's go, let's go another voice vote. Miguel. Aye. Christian. Aye. Nicole. Aye. And I vote aye. 
Best of luck to you. We will move on to the final agenda item of this evening's agenda, and that is the Institutional Master Plan for Johnston and Wales University. And commissioners, this is this is the presentation of Johnson and Wales University's five-year institutional master plan. And as you know, institutions are required to provide five-year updates of their master plans. And as you see with these type of presentations, the applicant will be talking about their campus planning initiatives, parking and traffic, any notable projects that will be occurring within this within the next five year timeline, landscaping and any other items that are required. So I guess the applicants here and they will be able to walk you through the plan. Thank you. Please go ahead and state your name uh, and affiliation for the record and uh, then go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. My name is Jason Witham, and I'm a vice president of real estate and facilities planning for Johnson and Wales University. Thank you. So, just uh, make sure, just for the viewers at home, uh, just make sure that microphone's close to your mouth so they can hear you. I apologize. I was connected um, via Zoom, and now it seems I am not. Let's try to zoom right back up so I can present my screen. I, you know what? I can uh, I can go ahead and and or do you have a slideshow? I, or? I, I had a slide presentation that really kind okay. of condensed it to the to the uh, yeah. Let's let's let's, 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 let's <laughs> have one. We were cooking, so we want to keep going. Yeah, we'll allow you the time to pull up your yeah, presentation. Yeah. Oh no, it's down to the well. You were cooking. <laughs> Like the Cuisinart Center for Culinary Excellence. <laughs> <laughs> do you need do you need the link, Jason? I, I, I got it. I'm joining right okay, now. Okay, great. There you are. Okay. Uh, make sure your um, volume is off on your computer and your mic is muted. Okay, so as um, Choyan mentioned, um, this is our five-year update. So we've already had a, a master plan that's been that's been in place. Uh, this is actually the third update that I've been involved with personally. So um, really, we just wanted to hone in specifically on some of the changes that um, have caused us to to ship from our from our last five year plan. Um, so if I may, I'll just start with, you know, we've got our we've, we've got our two campuses. So we'll start with the with the down city campus. Um, you can see that we've sold some properties so that our campus core has really been condensed to um, the area between Pine Street Way Bossett Street and, and being bound by Friendship Street as well. Um, what we what we have proposed, and this is again from our from our last five year update, um, are some buildings that are still you know three five years out. We really don't have a lot of definition for us at at this point. So we really consider them to be to be placeholders for our future. Um, there isn't a lot of design and a lot of a lot of uh, um, shape 
to these to these projects as of yet because we really don't have the demand for them. So if um, trends in higher education changes or the market changes, then we can see ourselves building these, but really they're they're not all on the horizon. Um, but just to just to sort of review, um, we've got our uh, this is sort of the vision. And so just to give everybody sort of a sort of a frame of reference, this is Johnson Hall where our Starbucks is. Um, so across from that right now it's a it's a service parking lot. So we've always envisioned that being some type of student center of some kind that would have housing on the on the on the upper floors. Um, this is our new Bowen Center that we built. It's uh, where we have our uh, College of Engineering and Design, as well as our Life Science Labs. That was our most recent new build, which was done in 2018. So we really see ourselves uh, moving, moving up this lot, which is now all open space. This is our student services building. Uh, and kind of creating a new gateway into our into our campus that would be easy access off 95, taking the point stream uh, exit, and then you know, being, being able to enter here. But um, all of that is you know, fifty. Below. Really, the one thing in our in our down city campus that we see um, happening in the, in, the, in the next year or so, and actually uh, will be taking shape this spring is in. Uh, in in Johnson Hall, uh, we're doing renovations to the second and third floor to uh, build out our accelerated nursing program. So uh, that's a good bit part of our college's health and wellness, and we think it's a really great location because it's uh, central to our, to our to our campus floor. It's uh, with our life science building, and this is also our physician's assistant program. So. It really creates a nice connectivity area. So, you know, other than that, it's uh, uh, for the next one to three years, there's nothing um, specifically planned other than just, you know, some minor renovations to keep up with our changes in our in our academic program. Uh, just so the commissioners know, I believe that these new buildings will be subject to downtown review, downtown design committee review prior to breaking ground, but this is what they basically all they need for, for their five-year master plan coming before us. Is that where the where the proposed buildings are? Is that on 195? Um, it is it's land that, that they purchased from the state of Rhode Island prior to the establishment of the I-195 commission. It's former highway land. Yeah, but that but but because because it transferred to them before the 195 commission was was put into place, uh, the review would be done by the city and not the 195 commission. Thank you. So this is just an exhibit that it would, one thing that we're really carefully honed in on, obviously, because um, where an urban campus is is our pedestrian circulation. So we always give directions to our campus, being um, our our parking garage, which is at the corner of Pine Street and Richmond, and then um, you know our, our our campus is very walkable and very uh, uh, pedestrian friendly with our with our pocket parks and green space created as much as we can within the city. So for the Harborside campus, um, we do have some. This is this is our this is our existing condition. And just to give you a frame of reference, as it relates to Providence, our uh, I wish you would put it on here, but the uh, the line between Cranston and Providence uh, just cuts the corner of this building and then cuts through uh, Harborside Boulevard. So. This part is in Cranston, and then this is in So we do have some things planned. Um, again, you know, we've got 
sort of the placeholders, which are which are holdovers from um, the last plan, uh, which would include uh, some new housing here, um, an extension to our recreation center. This is a ice hockey rink. We're really uh, hoping to do that uh, one day for our uh, hockey program. Uh, those were the carryovers. The new items that we're presenting on this plan, which we're, we're hoping will happen in the next one to three years. Uh, one is this uh, solar canopy area. So we do get some power interruptions on our on our campus from time to time. And when I say from time to time, it's usually two or three times a year. Um, so what we want to do is uh, create um, some, some battery backup. We do have generators for our buildings, but it's really just for life safety. And what happens is because the Harborside campus is our culinary campus, we have a lot of refrigeration. We have a lot of food. <laughs> that's in storage. So when the power goes out, there's always like this uh, big concern about food safety. So what we want to do is we're working with green development um, and um, through a program where with the covered parking, so we'd be creating some additional parking. It would be covered and the, and the, and the, and the cover would have solar panels on it. And they would feed um, battery backup to our to our culinary buildings, and they, they would really just serve our our, our refrigeration circuits. Um, the other item we've got noted here is a lease that we just recently signed with the Port of Providence. Uh, this area was always designated for us as future parking, and uh, we signed a land lease with them because they needed some additional space in order to enable. Get their operations to support some of the uh, offshore wind projects. So uh, they had, so they built a facility here to displace some parking, and this allows them to free up some additional parking where they can increase their activities here for play down areas and assembly of things. So that's recently signed. Uh, they have some other abilities later as the lease goes on in term to do some other uses, but we would of course come back in um, and modify our plan uh, by then. It, there's a administrative building that's allowable in our lease, but that's not be beyond 10 years. So we would update that if that evolved as a part of the partnership. Um, and we're looking for academic tie-ins with that as well. And then the final component that um, it's really just an idea uh, at this point. It's a controlled environment uh, agriculture facility. Really, it's just a big greenhouse. Uh, we're talking with a couple of industry partners about making some connections um, to um, having them as a tenant, as well as being able to expand in research and development um, as it relates to this growing industry of um, indoor food production. So uh, we're taking a look at expanding our academic programming to include that, do the research and really uh, expand our footprint in the food world um, beyond just uh, where we are now. So, so the that's uh, oh, the other item that's, that's, a, that's a holdover that we have uh, included is, is, is really just expanding on our athletics area, including the track and, and the track and field, which we've been deferring because um, we don't yet have a have a track team established. For the uh, for the least area for the for the additional parking um, for Propport, I'm I'm under the assumption that parking as a primary use is, is allowed in the zoning, but construction of that would have to meet all requirements, landscaping, stormwater, things like that under city regulations. Is, is that correct? And is that the plan? Yeah, that would be that would be their responsibility in, in order to fill those certainly. Okay. And and yes, you're you're absolutely right, Mr. Chair. We have spoken with a representative for Provport and they do have 
plans that they're developing that include stormwater and required landscaping. Great, thank you. The parking, I mean, we far exceed uh, all any of the parking regulations. I, I think um, just to conclude this, one thing that I that I that I should talk about because um, it was noted last time. So, in the in the in the Down City campus, we're able to meet the canopy coverage uh, because the way that the requirement is is that the tree canopy coverage has to be fifteen percent of the lot area not occupied by a structure. So we're at 37% doing that calculation and we far exceed it. For the Harborside campus, it's more difficult for us to meet the requirements because it actually requires uh, tree canopy coverage of 30% of the total area. So this was a comment that was noted last time as a deficiency in our plan. We were asked to work earnestly with the um, city forester to try to come up with um, a way to increase our canopy coverage. We've done that significantly. Um, it's difficult because we've got big buildings that take up a big footprint and then we've got large parking areas to accommodate the parking and we also have ball fields that you can't have trees in. <laughs> so um, so we're at 21 percent so we've made a we, we, we've made a big increase and a lot of that was um, um, efforts and we're part of Tree Campus USA. We also um, gathered some data on some trees that were on the perimeter of our campus that weren't weren't included in the in the in the prior ca uh, calculation. So we added that into our into our tree inventory. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, it's, uh, 1 percent with the addition or is that where you are presently? I'm sorry, is that where you're presently? Well, is that prior to the additions or changes? 21% is where is where we yeah. are currently. So you're off by like 40 something percent, right? You may, you may increase, yeah. 8%. Um, 8%, but I'm saying about 50% of where you are now, close to, oh, yes. right? Oh, yes, yes. The, the, the requirement in the zoning ordinance says that they're supposed to provide us with an inventory of tree canopy and landscaping on the property and provisions for coming into conformance or maintaining conformance with the ordinance. Um, I think uh, certainly the, the planting that's gonna be required as part of that parking lot development will count toward okay. this. And uh, you, are, you, you are engaged in conversations with the city forester, is that, is that correct? Yeah, they actually, we we have a committee as a part of our uh, Tree Campus USA. He's on our, he's on our committee. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, commissioners, any questions mm -hmm. of uh, the applicant in this matter? None for me. None. Um, so when um, we've spoken to uh, previous uh, mass, uh, excuse me, yeah, previous master plans with some of the institutions on campus, we talk about the contributions to the city. Um, obviously, pilot is one thing that comes up that's above, that's beyond our purview. But one thing we talk about is um, well, green space, but also the access to the community. And I know that you say you were adding to um, to the ball ballpark fields and maybe from the track. Are any of these facilities or amenities available to use for citizens in the area, or is it just you know closed off to the community only for the school use? No, it, we. Uh... We have many public uses, and it's not it's not free. We allow rentals of the of the of the spaces, but uh, we do have um, on the Harborside campus. We've got a uh, uh, coastal greenway that's not mm -hmm. shown on here that uh, is heavily used. That goes from the Save the Bay and yep. along the shoreline, and then curls back into our campus. So that's something that promotes yeah. public, free public yeah. access. That's that, it's like a little oval right, right near the, the uh, shoreline. Is that what you're referring to? It's uh, a linear it, walking path. No, I can, there's uh, a walking oh. path. I can show. Uh, there's, a, there's a Save the Bay, is that the same thing as a Save the Bay? It starts at Save the Bay. Okay. Um, 
you can see this yeah. this is save the bay right here and so you can see this this linear path this was this was developed uh, as a requirement of the coastal resources management um, agency so that's that's open to the public yeah that's the way uh, by the way by, by the way if if uh, if you if you want to get through the gates for Johnson and Wales say that, that you're going to walk on the urban coastal greenway and they'll let you in <laughs> okay. or you go to Pro the tip. <laughs> Going to watch a game. <laughs> well, just to add to my, I guess more of a recommendation because we have talked a lot about um, gaining access to some of the facilities. Obviously, not when it's in use, you know, for games right. or thing. But like, especially with the with a, a track where people can walk and run, um, I think that would be a great amenity. That if it could be expanded to the surrounding community, uh, would be a wonderful um, gesture on Jay Wool's behalf. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, with that, we uh, we will hear the staff report, and uh, we'll open up the public comment if there's nothing further for the applicant. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And the applicant has gone through the criteria that we look for when reviewing institutional master plans, and based on that, we find that it is in conformance with the comprehensive plan particularly strategy F of objective LU7, which requires education institutions to provide these five-year IMPs. And the applicant also talked about how new development will fit into the character of the neighborhood. And that is consistent with strategies A and B of objective LU7. And we also find that the plan conforms to the format that's prescribed by the zoning ordinance as they addressed each required criterion. And based on that, we would recommend that you approve this, that you approve this institutional master plan subject to the following condition, that the applicant consult with the city forester to determine a planting schedule to meet the canopy coverage requirement on the Harborside campus and the university should shall present their progress on meeting this requirement when presenting future iterations of the plan. Thank you, Troyan. All right, with this, this is a public hearing, so we will open it up to public comment. Is there anyone here in the audience? I have no one on my sign-in sheet. And is there anyone in the virtual world? If you are joining us online, please raise your virtual hand or press star nine if you're interested in speaking and calling in. And seeing none, we will close the public comment portion of this agenda item. Thank you very much for, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Um, institutional master plans. <laughs> They're pretty straightforward um, <laughs> on what we do here. Um, I'd like to make a motion. <laughs> Based on the analysis and the findings contained in the report and the uh, um, discussion from tonight. Uh, I recommend that we approve Johnson and Wales institutional master plan subject to the following condition that the applicant shall consult the city forester to determine a planning schedule and to meet the canopy re uh, coverage requirement on the Harborside um, campus. And the J. Wu shall present their progress on meeting the planning um, schedule in the future iterations of the plan. Thank you, Christian. Do we have a second? Second. All right. We'll go around with the voice vote. Miguel. Aye. Christian. Aye. Nicole. Aye. And I will vote aye. Still we passed. Still carries. Extension? Yes. All yes. right. There we go. Three. Yes. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate it. <clears throat> All right. That was the last agenda item. I will take a motion to adjourn. I will move to adjourn. And a second? Second. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>